Alan Nasseri. His topic is, oh shit, the top five major F-ups of my career and how I grew up from them. Uh, Kevin is a hands-on architect. As, um, he's been a security architect and a security engineer and consultant for more than a decade. And uh, please join me in welcoming Kevin. Right, thanks, everyone. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thanks uh, ThoughtCon for allowing me to come up here and bask in, in about 15 years of my own failure. Um, so in order to help kind of boost a little confidence uh, right here on the front page, I've kind of got the three, one, some of the three biggest uh, fuck-ups of the last century. Uh, we've got, the, in kind of increasing order of tragedy, we've got the Hindenburg, the Titanic, which is just barely within 100 years, and uh, the last Indiana Jones movie, which is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, so, I don't play poker. Uh, I enjoy the game, but I'm not very good at it. One, I'm not good at it from a mental arithmetic perspective and calculating odds. Uh, I'm good at math, but not that kind of math. And the second reason is just I'm kind of a really terrible liar. I was doing a, a pen test about two years ago, and it was the first pen test, and they had it kind of included on the statement of, of work phone pretexting. And uh, I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. I guess I'll, I'll take the gig. But, uh, you know, and most the rest of it was all just kind of stuff that I was already comfortable with. So I spend like two days coming up with, you know, I call my, it's a hospital I'm doing a pen test on. And I call my dad and sister who are doctors. And I figure out this scenario in which, you know, okay, I've got a patient, uh, you know, from Chicago in this hospital somewhere in the out west. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to call up the ER and say, hey, I've got a patient. He's in your neck of the woods. He's got an emergency. I have this MRI imaging study that we did last week that when he comes into the ER, your doctors, you know, definitely need this study in order to, to treat care. And I was going to, you know, send him a, a link with a, essentially like an MRI viewer, you know, .exe, which would have been, you know, some, you know, made exploit payload or something like that. So... I set this whole thing up, and I've got, you know, all my, my information, and, like, I call him up, and literally the first words out of my mouth were, was, I am Kevin Nossery. <laughs> like, I just introduced myself with my real name, and it kind of went downhill from there. So, my, uh, like, my tell is quite literally, I will just tell you the truth when I'm trying to, to lie. So... Um, I, I don't play poker, but I do watch a lot of movies, and uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, from Rounders. Uh, and Rounders, uh, the main character, Mike McDermott, he has this, uh, this quote that he uses. And the quote doesn't really display here, but uh, the actual quote is, as, as funny as it may seem, every player w uh, can remember with remarkable accuracy the uh, tough beats of his career, but very few remember their successes. And I think that's true for everyone. Unfortunately, in poker, there's a uh, direct correlation to losing money with tough beats. And in our jobs, it's maybe indirect in some cases. But generally, we just have the advantage of, of being able to learn from our mistakes and getting better at our jobs. So uh, I don't really, um, when I have a rough day now, I just kind of take it with a little bit of emotional distance, re reflect on it. And uh, that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. It's kind of five rough days where I uh, made a mistake and kind of the lesson that I got from it. So hopefully the, the two things that you'll take away from this is, one, that the bad days are kind of what is going to make us better. You know, if we push ourselves outside of our box with a little bit of failure, you know, we're going to grow and we're going to get better at what we do. And the second thing is to really... Uh, you know, hopefully you'll gain something from some of the lessons that I've already learned in what is a, uh, I'm not terribly old yet, but I did start pretty young, so I've got about 15 years of, of uh, technical uh, engineering and architecture. And my background is, uh, is kind of on this page. You know, I grew up, I was always into computers from age uh, 12 and 13. I kind of got the Linux Unleashed book with, that had the copy of Slackware 3.0 before it was feasibly downloadable, um, you know, on 14.4 modems. Uh, so I grew up in kind of a small town in Illinois, and if you picture Illinois as a chubby guy uh, facing California, which I can help you with because I have the perfect Illinois profile and body, 
Quincy, Illinois is the belly button. This analogy also works great because uh, I always refer to East St. Louis as kind of the balls of Illinois. So it's, it's also pretty much uh, right on track there. Um, I had a, a really good start in computers. One of the reasons there's this, uh, the first internet provider in Quincy was called uh, BCL or Basic Communications Limited. And these guys were cool guys. They definitely, it was across the street from my junior high. And they let me come and hang out uh, and kind of learn about computers. And they never treated me like a kid. Uh, and I spent a lot of time. And it was like a real uh, old school Unix shop. They, we had Next Turbo Color wor workstations, an, an SGI Indigo 2, an HP 9000, uh, Sun LX20. And then they were just starting to use more and more uh, Linux boxes. So, like, I mean, that's a good way to learn Unix is to see how each commercial distribution, you know, the, some of, most of the major commercial Unix distributions did stuff slightly differently. Um, I was fortunate enough to have very supportive parents as well, so I had uh, ISDN at home, and uh, I started hosting my own core uh, services, DNS, Bind, uh, you know, uh, mail exchange host for, for my own domain, um, you know, IRC servers, Apache web servers. So I got good at kind of building out and hosting my own services. And, you know, a couple of years later, they sold that ISP, and uh, the next ISP, this uh, KSNI, Curlin Supernet, the two guys who were really the technical leads for, for BCL both got jobs with Xyland. It's an Ethernet switching company that later got acquired by Alcatel. Um, and they were helping this kind of eccentric millionaire that I'll talk about on the next slide start a new ISP called Curlin Supernet. The guy's name is uh, Don Curlin. And... You know, they, so they got this job, and they were kind of designing things and starting out, but they needed kind of a hands-on presence locally. They were both uh, moving to, to Columbia, Missouri. So in terms of thinking about, you know, who's, who's the right guy to kind of be their, their feet on the ground, they kind of came to me with, uh, you know, this offer. And it, it was a great opportunity for me to actually start kind of working in, in professional. I was, I was 15 at the time. So... You know, later on, I went, uh, when I went to college, I quickly dropped out to ride the dot-com boom down on Exodus's heels. Uh, I was with their professional services group for two years doing uh, Unix, network engineering, and security consulting. Um, after that, I moved on to a company called Classified Ventures, which runs uh, cars.com, apartments.com, and some real estate back-end. Uh, I was their chief infrastructure architect for four years, and then I went back to security consulting because I think that's... Um, pretty interesting work, and I, I worked with Concierge for a couple of years. Uh, right now, I run the uh, attack and penetration testing team for U.S. Bank. So, um, most three of the stories we'll talk about today all took place when I was a kid, because uh, ironically, I, or not ironically, but it's it's pretty easy to guess that most of the the major things you've done wrong in your life generally fall through in that age period of 16 to 18 years old. For, for me, that's true anyway. I just so happened to be working as a sysadmin and an ISP at a time, so they mostly happened at work. Uh, Curlin Supernet, uh, this guy was, uh, this, and this is a picture of him. One of his, his eccentricities, he was a formal naval aviator, and he has a lot of family money. So he uh, purchases Soviet aircraft, like MiG-21s, uh, MiG-29s. He restores them to working order. And then uh, he owns this company where he'll, you, like, the U.S. government can hire him to fly by and simulated attack on Puerto Rico or something. And, uh, you know, the, it, it's just kind of a, an amazing civilian in, endeavor. Um, but then at the same time, the guy would, like, tool around in this minivan with wood paneling on the side. That's not a picture of his minivan, but it's a minivan just like that. And, like, we would have dinner meetings for the ISP, and he'd always show up in, like, running shorts, like, I don't, I don't really understand how, like, shorts down to covering a mid-length you know, mid knee would be so much more uncomfortable for him, and yet so, so much more comfortable for all the rest. So, like, I, I don't know. The guy, is, it was, he was a character, and generally it was, it was pretty good. He was pretty hands-off at the whole ISP thing, uh, and he apparently did not have an issue with, you know, the average age. I was a sysadmin, and then we had, I, had, I was training even younger people, mostly because older people really wouldn't tolerate me that much. Um, and it wasn't a big ISP. It was, you know, 4,000 clients, uh, I think, in its, in its max. Um, and it was, uh, it was located 
This guy's family business is a, it's like a Curlin's Hallmark distributor, so they do like the candies and post, uh, you know, postcards and stuff like that. Um, we were in a corner of his, uh, the warehouse for that, the local warehouse for that business, which was a converted Kmart, so it was kind of an interesting, um, I mean, essentially, you know, like how the aesthetic of like the Kmart bathroom area where you'd go, like, I don't know in what situation somebody would actually use the Kmart bathroom area. But, like, that's the aesthetic of this ISP. Um, so the first story that I'm going to get into kind of starts, it's a two-part story. The first part, I didn't really learn anything from, and it was just a really pretty good time. But there was this uh, kind of 19-year-old kid, and I don't even really remember how he started working there. He's doing phone tech technical support. Uh, I think maybe he was, like, a waiter at one of the uh, restaurants that the two guys from BCL ate out a lot. And eventually they, they let him do tech support there. And he was just really kind of hard because he, he had no ambition. He was just kind of a hard personality to, to get along with. And I don't know, I just always thought of him as kind of a loser. And we would pretty much antagonize him. I mean, because, you know, we, he was doing phone tech support and, you know, I had kind of a pretty cush gig where I was the only one in the city that was capable of doing stuff. So I kind of, my behavior towards other people wasn't always the best. But one of the things that he had done, we never had any good chairs in the office. Like, that was just not in the budget ever. Like, I mean, these chairs would be better. We had a mix of, like, folding chairs and, like, old, uh, like, old desk chairs that were, like, missing a wheel. So we'd, like, prop the wheel up on, like, an Adtran CSU DSU that we weren't using. Like, it was just really a shaky situation. Like, I, I fell on my ass so many times. Just because, you know, uh, so one day I'm hanging out with a buddy of mine who doesn't work there, but he's actually a customer of the ISP. He was our first co-location customer. He ran this, like, website that was, like, supporting uh, some online game, like Earth 2020 or something like that, some shitty online game. Uh, but really what he was doing is he was scamming DoubleClick, uh, the DoubleClick advertising. He, he built into his website code, like, a random algorithm to produce one-by-one pixels of double click ads and then like he even produced like JavaScript code to click through so like he was c collecting the click through revenue for them so he had enough money from based on the scheming to pay our co-location fees so it was a good relationship uh, so he and I you know and then this this kid the the other guy the loser that we didn't like one of the things he had done is he had gone to this like local auction house and bought these like three even rickety or shittier chairs than we already had. Like, and, like they couldn't even they had wheels on them, but all the wheels would like lock up, so you'd always just like push off. Anyway, so in order to kind of to screw with this guy, you know, so because we're in the belly button of Illinois, fireworks are illegal in Illinois, but they are legal in Missouri. So it's like 15 minutes in the summer. You know, a fireworks shop always opens up. So we went, and I bought like 40 bucks worth of fireworks, which uh, combined with the 1995 inflation rate and uh, the fact that fireworks are pretty dirt cheap, uh, it was a shit ton of fireworks. And we just like strategically taped into this guy's chair. And at the end, it was like a monstrosity. Like we couldn't, we, like, we were like, okay, we got to put this and take it back to Missouri because if somebody catches us blowing this chair up, you know, it's like it was a definite catch. So we went back over to this train yard in, uh, in West Quincy, which is in Missouri, and, you know, we blow up this chair. And at one point, it's, like, scary, because we're in a train yard, and at some point, like, the Saturn rocket missiles that we had taped to the chair got aimed at us, and, like, they were coming at us, and we were running. It was, like, the, the, the running scene from Stand By Me. Like, we were all running, but it combined, like, missiles, so it was even better than that. Um, so this chair blows up, and we see the aftermath, and we're just so giddy with ourselves that we're like, well, what do we do now? And the smart thing would have been to leave the chair that back there. We put it in my trunk, and we brought it back to the office. Uh, and, you know, what do you do with a, a burnout chair carcass that smells of fireworks and gunpowder at a uh, Kmart with, you know, a Kmart ISP with eight guys working there? You put it in the women's bathroom. There's no women that ever use that bathroom. Um, so that chair is in the bathroom, and that's kind of the first part of the story. And at some point, and I don't remember when, ever, or who might have taken it, but the chair disappears, and we don't really think much of it. But 
we didn't use all the fireworks because $40 worth of fireworks is a shit ton of fireworks. So we had fireworks left over in the office. And I got into the habit, like when we get bored at some point, you know, we'd set fireworks off outdoors. As time went on, I got a little bit more brazen. And occasionally I would drop like some of the bigger bottle rocket stuff, like the, in the picture there, into like a Mountain Dew bottle, like a plastic Mountain Dew bottle and screw the cap on, and then it would just like shrivel up, and there wasn't a lot of smoke because it would just get oxygen deprived um, until it, like the, the bottle ruptured. And like I did that probably a dozen times. One day I go to do that same thing, and I kind of fumble, fumble with it. I'm not the most dexterous cat in the world, and I can't get the, the top on, so I do what every you know, reasonable person does when they have a firework that's about to go off. I just drop the bottle, and it goes off inside. Didn't seem like a big deal. So, mind you, we're in a warehouse that has probably three to four million dollars worth of chocolate and other bullshit in it. So, they have a fairly good alarm system. But, you know, we're, so we're airing the place out, and there's like four of us, and we're just talking outside, and, you know, it didn't seem like that much smoke, because it's a real voluminous room. Like, the ceiling's higher than this, um, you know, a lot of square footage. So, we didn't really think anything would happen. And, in fact, the first time that, you know, we hear some sirens in the distance, and the very first thing we start doing is joking, be like, wouldn't it be funny if they were coming here? Because of the, the thing. And as they get close, this is about three or four minutes of that until these fire trucks pull into this parking lot and drive right past us. And we're like, whoo. And then they stop at the other side of the warehouse. So we have our own entrance. But the fire alarm main panel is in the, they have to go check it to figure out what sensors went off. Now, luckily, the uncle of the guy that I blew the chair up with months before, his uncle ran the alarm service company we're using. And so, and we gave him free internet. So he came in, because he was kind of the first on the scene. He got dispatched as well. And he came in and he gave us the heads up and he's like, hey, I don't know what the fuck you kids are doing in here, but the, uh, the alarm panel just went off for this area and it smells like fucking gunpowder in here. So maybe you guys should get some story straight while I go tell these guys where you guys are. So we got a little bit of heads up. So my brain starts churning and this is, uh, really where it would have been helpful to be a good liar, but I'm not a good liar, as I talked about. So these guys come in. It's like four burly fire, firemen guys. These guys rock in, and they're like snooping around. And then there's, uh, this is the best pictural representation of this guy. He's the, the, this is actually Fred Phelps. And in my head, it's, it's essentially the same level of anger. He's like, God hates cis Edmonds. Um, but uh, it's the same level of anger in my head that's de depicted here. He really Kool-Aid's man into the situation. Like, you know, these guys are looking for a fire, theoretically. And he's, like, first through the door, like, kicking it open. So, and he is irate. And I, had, I think I had met him once or twice before, but I've never seen anybody so mad in my life. And uh, so the firemen come in behind him, and they start checking things out. And, uh, you know, they look and they find the sensor and they kind of confirm that there's no fire there. And then they start to interview me. Meanwhile, this guy is yelling that he's yelling about the chair. He's like, these guys are pyromaniacs. I found a, a, a burnout chair. And at, once he said that, I was like, well, this is the best moment of my life because I was like, what, what chair? There's no chair in the bathroom. <laughs> because somebody had taken it. He might have been the guy that removed it, but it was just like a very good... Uh, point for me in that conversation. It's probably the only highlight of the story that I can remember. But, and then I have to come up with the story. Uh, and at this point, the guy's so mad at us, and I can kind of get a feel from the firemen that they just don't give a fuck. Like, they're just glad some b baby wasn't burning up and, uh, and that it's a false alarm. And I, so I have to come up with a lie. And my lie, like I said, I'm not a good liar, but I was like, well, somebody printed out a password list, and we had to burn it. <laughs> for security reasons. And they were like, don't you own a fucking shredder? I mean, like, what? And I, I was like, well, that's a good point, but we're on a very tight budget around here. And yes, we could have gone outside, but uh, so, so that was the, uh, the story there. And I guess, you know, the, the moral of, of that story for me, and it is, a, it is a big turning point for me, is that, you know, I spent a lot of time being, kind of, when I was bored, just kind of being unproductive and, and uh kind of destructive and you know that was the point at switch is you know if I have free time and I get bored I've got a perfect opportunity here to kind of innovate get better at what I'm doing you know I'm I've got a lot of things yet to, to learn so that was kind of a pivotal moment for me where I kind of I buckled down and also it was like 
I had a really good thing going, and I came this close. You know, I'm using illegal fireworks uh, to, to blow up people's chairs, and I'm setting them off inside this three to four million dollar warehouse. Like, the, ver the level for me getting fired, if it were at all possible for this business to survive and me get fired at that point, like, I would have been out of there. But luckily, I had enough uh, leverage to, to keep me there through the situation, um, and I never really heard anything af out of it after those firemen left. Um, until like years later when I was trying to negotiate for more money. And they're like, Did, weren't you the guy who blew up the chair and then almost burned down the warehouse? So, you know, that, that was uh, a pretty, pretty good lesson for me to learn. Um, one, one of our, so moving on, the, the next story I have is about this, uh, this customer. And this is a real website, or was at the time. It's called NeuroGames. And really what it was is like, it was like a turn-based game, and you would roll for your character, your fighting character of some sort. I don't know, how many, how many people have ever seen Deadliest Warrior? All right, so a lot of people have seen Deadliest Warrior. Uh, it's not a great show, but uh, if you take the one cool part out of the show, like in the show, they do all these tests, and they collect this data, and then they run the simulation. And then the only cool part of the show is that they reenact and choreograph like a... a dramatized version of the scenario, right? That's really not based on anything. But, like, they intermix that with, like, a really boring, like, an Excel spreadsheet that's calculating all these tasks. So this was just, like, the really boring part of that whole situation. It was, you know, it was written in Perl, and it's some of the... I, I'm glad the guy's not here because I was looking on his LinkedIn last night, the, the guy who wrote the site, and he actually did some Unix security consulting later on in his career, but... It was some of the worst written Perl CGI code I'd ever seen in my life. And to that point, I would constantly get paged at like 2 in the afternoon by our monitoring software that like the, the virtual web server um, box was just crushed with load from all these, you know, CGI processes. And like I, you know, the, probably the third time it happened, I, I was just like, well, I've had enough of this. Uh, so I wrote, a, this is pretty close to the actual cron job I wrote. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if the off fields lined up, but I basically just wrote a script. And it, I prided myself that it was complete, like it didn't look for his username. Uh, so it didn't like target him, but it essentially tested if, uh, you know, web threads were, uh, you know, over 2% memory or 5% memory or, or something like 10% in this example. And the CPU time was over 5% or something. It would kill a thread. And so I was just like a governor uh, every five minutes that would recover the web server. So I put this in place on maybe a Saturday. Uh, and I get this page on Tuesday in sixth period, because re remind I was six, 16 or 17 at the time. So I'm actually in school when I get this page. And the page is it's an Alpha New York page that's like, hey, Kevin, when are you going to be in the office? And I'm, I, uh, I call in between class, and I'm like, what do you mean? I, you know, I, I don't have a set time to be in the office. They're like, somebody's waiting for you. And I'm like, and I had kind of heard, like, the guy who owned this thing was kind of like, a, it was a martial artist MMA fighter. He's like 6'2", 240. I'm like, you mean, who's waiting for me? And he's like, the NeuroGames guy. I'm like, Kurt, the MMA fighter from Springfield. And to give you an idea geographically, with so if, uh, you know, Quincy is the belly button of Illinois, I'm not very good at internal anatomy, but Springfield's in the center of the state. So for me, at least, I'm sure it would be in my vast stomach region. Um, but, uh, you know, this guy drew, drove like two hours to come and, and uh, talk to me. And he didn't even know necessarily that I had uh, deployed this script. Like, he wouldn't have known. It was kind of, I mean, it just kind of killed his threads. He, he was just like, the box was kind of unstable from his perspective because he had no, no idea when he was trying to run all these weekly game simulations of fights, why they would fail. So he was pissed. Uh, and he came. And so this is like 1 PM. And I've got like two more classes that I have to go to. And I think I'm doing something after school, just playing chess or something like that. But anyway, I show up like two to three hours later. And when I show up, the guy is not even in the office. He is waiting in the parking lot. And I don't know if he refused to come inside until I was there. Or if the guy inside was like, maybe you should wait in the parking lot. <laughs> but he's there two hours later, standing, leaning against his car with like one of the most pissed, not the Fred Phelps pissed, but like the, man, I could kick anybody's ass pissed. And he's waiting for this, you know, for me. Uh, and it was, you know, I was like, hey, uh, what's going on? 
And he's like, something's going on. My site's not working. This is all your fault. And I'm like, yeah, it actually is my fault. I'll, I'll show you what I did. So I come in, and I show him what I did. And I kind of lean on the air. Like, uh, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, one of the, law, the dramatic law and order guys where I'm clinging to the idea that because it doesn't target his username, it's like a matter of justice and that he's hurting other people's sites just as much as I'm hurting his site. And, uh, you know... I don't know. To, to his credit, he, although he kind of made an effort to be physically intimidating through the whole thing, and he could have just called, and we could have worked it out, uh, you know, because he's like two hours away. Like, he could just call me, and we'd fix it. But he, uh, he understood that, that there is some, you know, that his site impacted other people, and, uh, you know, I think we started off, like, I gave him, the, I pulled the, pulled the code I had written, and I just told him to definitely agree to a window uh, late at night where he could run his stuff until he could get it working better. And I don't think he ever really got it working that much better. So from then on out, if you wanted to go to any website at 2 a.m. that we hosted virtually, uh, it was kind of a no-go. But <laughs> you know, the, the lesson here is that I made a, a huge mistake, in terms, not in terms of reacting to the issue necessarily, but I, I was working in a vacuum. Like Nobody on Earth knew what I had, had done to and what I had designed in terms of, of killing that process. So it just made the whole platform unstable for him, like from his perspective. Like that opacity that I introduced, it wasn't the fact that I was killing his processes so much as that I changed the system in a way that he could not assume how it was going to work. Um, and I can understand from an engineering perspective for him how that would have been frustrating. So from then on, I was, uh, you know, that was kind of the last thing that I did out of not spite, maybe spite. But, uh, and, you know, with that warped sense of justice. But it was just some, you know, from then on out, I was a lot more transparent and I was a lot more engaged. You know, I should have called him the first time his scripts had, had crashed the server, but, you know, I was just kind of passive aggressive and, and I, I wrote this, uh, you know, this thing. So, you know, really the, the lesson for me here was to kind of increase transparency and, uh, you know, stop working in a vacuum and, and being and just be more engaged with my uh, my customers you know they're they're definitely part of the business here um, <laughs> you know the third story and we'll we'll move quickly through through this one uh, I was in that same ISP and I was I was playing chess with a buddy of mine and we had these two boxes these two servers that were running XDM um, you know the the X Windows login manager and I see them start to go into that like when you screw up an XF86 config and it's in like run level five, so like it flashes, and then it flashes again, and you just get pissed, and there's nothing you can do to save the run level, um, except for like SSH and remotely. So I start to see that happen out of the blue. So I run over, and I spend like three to four minutes kind of scooting between servers, and it's like clear right off the bat. Like this, this was not some cuckoo's egg sneak around for eight months bullshit. This was a guy on the machines just taunting and screwing with people. And within like 10 minutes, people, like, I, people have recounted this incident for me, and I just yell, you know, shit, you know, and, that, and that's like right at the time that he starts to, to actually melt servers down. And I think luckily his command of choice was probably rm-rf slash. So alphabetically, I think at the time with the Linux kernel, it hit, hit the device tree um, because dev was, was pretty, you know, I lost like bin or whatever. Once it, it took out the device tree, I think the box locked up and it, the delete stopped. So I was able to get most of the data. I didn't actually have backups at the time. One of the lessons learned from this was to actually back shit up. Uh, this was the, the, the buffer overflow that, that he used. Was, it was an NFS uh, Mount D buffer overflow, and I really shouldn't have been running NFS on anything anyway. But, you know, the lesson here, this was, a, you know, the pivotal moment where I kind of got way more into security. Um, you know, in terms of minimizing attack surface, um, you know, patching windows and just uninstalling software and services I didn't need. Um, that, that was kind of a critical, I could have easily avoided, you know, the next 24 hours worth of pain uh, if I had been a little bit more security conscious in that moment or leading up to that moment. The next one is a good one. I, I kind of call it the Kevin the Middle attack. I, I was uh, working at Classified Ventures. This is years later, and I actually have like a good real job. Um, and one of my responsibilities is I'm I'm kind of supporting this uh, enterprise technology data warehousing group. And I'm just uh, I built out a new Linux box, and uh, you know I think I I kickstarted it off my laptop because the the core kickstart infrastructure kind of sucked. Another group managed it, so I just built it off my laptop, and I was rehosting it. 
Uh, and on, it was a Red Hat box, so uh, to set the IP of the Red Hat box, you essentially edit this file if config eth zero. Um, so <laughs> I put this box online, and I started doing something else. 40 minutes later, because I'm in the data center and everybody else is downtown in Chicago, and they call me out and they're like, hey, Kev, we're having a major outage. We don't know what's going on. Uh, can you start to go down the network stack to figure out you know, connectivity, if there's any physical link errors or anything like that? And I'm just like, I'll call you back in five minutes. And I knew immediately what I had done. I inverted the interface and gateway address in ifconfig eth0. And, on the, and this was a web server, so it was like adjacent to all the other web servers. So I stole the default gateway from the big IP uh, F5 load balancer. And uh, so no one of the web servers had a default route out to the internet. So, you know, it's a really simple mistake to make. And it just had this huge impact. And it really kind of illuminated, like, first of all, I had had a lot of success in my career. This was one of the rare moments where I not only screwed up, like I burnt a chair down uh, and somebody caught it or I set a firework off inside. I made a technical mistake that caused a severe business. Like, I'm the first person and I think the last person that has ever taken down all three major lines of business, and this is like a $500 million a year revenue company, uh, for all three major lines of business. And not only, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I think I'm the only person that, that's ever done that is I d then spent the next year of my life correcting the architectural and design issues uh, and introducing some compartmentalization between different web servers um, so that you cannot steal the one default gateway for the entire company's business revenue by screwing up this uh, net config. Uh, the last moment is at the same company. Uh, and I actually talked at layer one a couple years about this, a couple years ago about this. And the, uh, the major issue, I had been chosen for this leadership program. And I was like, oh, I'm really moving on up to this uh, company. And it was like a young manager's, you know, anybody who had people reporting to him that was under like 30 was like eligible. And I was selected as like one of three. And the whole program turned out to kind of suck and there wasn't much value there. But one of the things they did was they paid for like the legitimate 360 review process to happen. So like you get peers reviewing you, people that work for you, your bosses, their bosses, everybody provides input. And I get this feedback back one day and I'm like, oh, I'm going to be awesome. People are going to really be happy with my work. I was just blown away. Like some of the quotes, like you can read them on, on there and I'll probably post these up later and I, you can watch the layer one talk. But it's essentially like Kevin is really good at sysadmin uh, stuff. And he, the other part is he's a huge asshole. Like, and I, I was like, I'm not a big asshole in like my personal life. And I, I realized essentially what I was doing is, is I was, uh, you know, when I knew something and when I was right about something, I wasn't really listening to other people. And that was kind of my major issue there. So um, that's pretty much all I have. And I'm out of time. So I will uh, head back to whatever room that they keep people. If you want to have stories of your own to, to share, I can't imagine you have any questions about this stuff. But uh, I'll definitely have other stories that are less meaningful to me. So. All right, talk to you guys later. Bye.